It's your boy Judea Black Shalom Line Purified Drink of Water. They got it is out there. Shouts out to the 12 tribes. I got it is right there. Um, okay, so we was talking about the uh, right field. So this is the beginning of the right field. And the only reason I'm calling them right field because we was talking about, I mean, right field, excuse me, because we were talking about the um, the being black in Israel. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to talk about some other stuff. And oh, and I know you heard my new, uh, that music I like is all slowed down and all. Uh, or top and screw type. I kind of like it like that for this whole little right field thing. So that's what that's going to be. It's like, make it your light, make it your low. Either way, go. It got a little soul in it. You know what I mean? So what I'm getting about this whole little right field thing is we're going to talk about um, uh, Emancipation Proclamation, Emmett Till. We're about to talk about the, um, hold on, I got the list of stuff right here. We're about to talk about the black codes. We're about to talk about the cold facts. We're about to talk about 40 acres in the mule, poverty, uh, special field order 15, objective eight and all that stuff. We're about to get into all of that with this right field thing. So that's what that is. And uh, like I said, um, you gonna stand for Israel, you gotta stand for Palestine. If you gonna stand for Palestine, you gotta stand for Israel because we support the people and not the cause. And I hope today found you safer than yesterday did. And I hope tomorrow finds you safer than today and the day before. Um, like I said, we inside today because we got to be, so that's just what it is. So we're running these right field things. So welcome to the right field. And, um, hey, I stopped. 20 something videos, man. This right field about the wrong one. So let's get straight into that. So I said I was going to do this like this. Uh, cue the music I like. American Over the course of the entire 20th century, we know that black farmers have lost about 12 million acres of land total. We are just being forced out. They're trying to force us out. These cases of dispossession can only be called theft. Mount Bayou is an historic all-black town. Um, formed many years in the 1800s by two former slaves. We don't have the overt racism that we used to have against people out in the public. Now we deal with it with uh, employment, uh, economics, banks. We still deal with it, and until we overcome all of that, the Delta will forever struggle, is my belief. Oh, I'm going to help them get this, get a pilot pipe loaded so they can still start putting the pilot pipe in. I've been doing this all of my life. As a kid, we went to the field until it was dark. Either cotton chopping or cotton picking. The Mississippi Delta is this area between these rivers in the northwest of Mississippi that has some of the most fertile land in the United States, in the continent, really. If you go out there, you'll see rows and rows of cotton, of soybeans, every single type of crop you can imagine. But in the early 20th century, almost all the land was owned by white folks. It was homesteaded out by the federal government, or was otherwise inaccessible to black folks. My grandpapa, Ed Scott Sr., started purchasing land back in 1938. They came from Hale County, Alabama, and they moved to Mississippi in 1919 before my dad was born. My grandmama hated it here, but in Alabama, black people could only share crop. No one would sell them land. Very few could get the historic 40 acres in the mule. Ed Scott Sr. was almost supernaturally gifted at farming. He knows exactly how to rotate the crops, how to plant things in a way that, that gets the, the highest yields, and that gave him his own economic gravity that local white businessmen could not ignore. 
Eventually, a plantation owner decides to sell Ed Scott Sr. a plot of land. When he passed in 1957, the family had acquired acres and acres of land. Ed Scott's son, Ed Scott Jr., takes over the farm. He is part of the generation of men that goes off to war during World War II. And when this generation of black men comes back, their white peers are granted so many free things from the GI Bill. They get free education, lots of them get free homes, they get things they can pass on to their children. But the black men among that number are denied many of those opportunities. My dad went to World War II, and when he came back, his dad wanted him to go and finish school. But farming is in his blood. You, you had to know what you're doing to make a living here. You had to. My daddy used to bale hay and, and, and uh, sell chicken and turkeys. He used to take turkeys to Greenwood down there and white people and so on. My dad was the smartest one of his stippler and the hardest worker of his stippler. You know, every now and then he'll say, God ain't gonna make no more land. So you better hold what you got. When Ed Scott Jr. takes over the farm, he's operating it through one of the most turbulent times in American history. Freedom, 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 freedom. 1953, the first bus boycotts. 1954, Brown v. Board. 1955, Emmett Till is lynched. You know, I left here and went to Selma, Alabama when they had the march of Selma and the Montgomery. Mm -hmm. It was rough back then, but you had to have some guts to stand up and just be rough with them. When he owned his land, he actually had 57 families who lived on his land and worked with him. And it was like a community. Whatever we needed was on our farm. We would put up peaches, we would put up peas and butter beans, and everybody got their share to carry them across the winter. It was like a utopia. Modern farming requires debt in order to grow your crops, in order to collect a harvest. Over the past hundred years, the federal government has become more and more of a player in providing the credit to those farmers. Much of the administration of this federal money was done by locally elected committees. And what do we know about voting in the South at that time? We know black people could not vote. The people who ended up controlling all that were the great-grandchildren of the plantation owners. And why would they ever give a black farmer money to start his own farm. And so between 1950 and 1969, black farmers lose something on the order of six million acres of land across the country. But the Scots were able to hold on to most of their land until the farm crisis of the 1970s and 1980s. Rising fuel costs, increasing cost of production, new taxes, these changes will have a significant impact on the well-being of family farmers. Federal legislators are slashing farm programs to pay for the deficit. As farming in America collapses in the 70s and 80s, there's a lifeline in the Mississippi Delta, catfish. The federal government, they pour a whole bunch of money into taking these poor white farmers who are struggling, getting them into catfish. The people who are left out of that are the black farmers. Ed Scott Jr. sees what's happening. He sees catfish as a way out. He converts most of his farms into eight giant catfish ponds with no help from the federal government. He digs them himself. He builds the very first catfish plant owned and operated by an African American in the United States and it becomes this inspirational story across the South of a black person who has literally beat all the odds to create something new. My dad loved clothes and he loved to dress. Even on a daily basis, 
he wore what we call khaki suits, which would have been a khaki shirt with matching pants, and they had to be starched and ironed. He always had a nice new car, but he kept it closed up in a shed so no one would know he had it. He did not co-mingle, meaning uh, white people were called staying in your place. Well, no blacks supposed to have a car. There's gonna come a time when they think you're uppity. And that's exactly what happened to this guy. It wasn't just because we were black, it's because we, we was doing so well in front. We were doing so well. Blacks were never successful at getting enough money to farm with from USDA. So when they went in to get the money for the crop, they gave them half of what they need, which was the way of keeping blacks from being successful. Because if you're gonna grow beans and you say, I need this much for fertilizer, I need this much for crop protection, I need this much for seeds, and I need this much for watering, and you only get half of that, if there's no way for you to produce a good crop. Yeah, they didn't use to try to buy no land in Mississippi. You never owned no land in Mississippi. The white people, people ain't gonna let you own no land in Mississippi. That's what the county agent will tell me. It's documented. They did not offer him the same loan terms. They regularly offered him much smaller loans than they did white farmers in the area. The county agent, he refused to give him a loan. So he could not feed his fish, could not water his crops. They foreclosed on his land. At its peak, the Scotts farm spanned across 1,000 acres. Now it was down to just 300. Who won it? Black farmers. Win! Now! In 1997, thousands of black farmers sued the USDA for discrimination. What's known as the Black Farmers Lawsuit is actually called Pigford versus Glickman, one of the largest class action lawsuits filed on behalf of black farmers against the USDA and the federal government. There's a wide disparity in the way the Department of Agriculture treats black farmers versus white farmers. Because of the practice, the discriminatory practices of USDA, I was put out of business. Uh, my family was destroyed, and basically they've just destroyed my life. The Scots become one of the marquee families in this lawsuit. Okay, this is just where we were working on the lawsuit and I had to go back and show where my daddy had taken out promissory notes with USDA as the backer. I tried to keep everything I could. Now the government, the U.S. Department of Agriculture in this case, admits they discriminated against black farmers, unfairly denying them federal loans, for instance. I'm very pleased that the uh, judge approved the settlement so that we can uh, begin to process these cases and black farmers can begin to receive this, their long, long overdue settlements. The federal government paid out just north of $2 billion and upwards of 70,000 successful claims were made by black farmers in the South. The Scots, received one of the largest settlements out of this lawsuit because unlike lots of people, they had the documents to show exactly the ways in which the federal government discriminated against them. Most farmers were lucky to get $20,000. I can't, I'll give you the exact figure later, but uh, it was right, a little over $7 million. He was blind, but we made sure that he signed the documents to buy his land back and he presented the check to the same man who was instrumental in taking his land. He was still in office. It took the Scott family nearly 30 years, a space of a generation, to buy their land back. Land hunger, as W.E.B. Du Bois describes it, is this almost mystical drive to seek and to own something in this United States among people who were once property themselves. If you look at 
the Scots. You look at what the land meant to them. It wasn't just money. It was destiny. It was something to hold on to. It was a purpose and something that held their family together through generations. It grieves me that we were denied a history, and that's how I see it. Um, and I'm trying not to cry. It's dear to me that my children know what my ancestors went through for us to be where we are and who we are. And for my dad, having the land and keeping the land, that was his dream. That was the heritage. The land was the heritage. <laughs>